So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Lacey Ballinger and I'm the Director of Collections and Exhibits at the Tallahassee Museum. And this series, Museum Mixology, is offered bi-monthly now at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursdays. I'm really excited with our lineup we have for this spring. We have speakers ranging from archaeologists to Olympians, oceanographers to autism experts. This series, Museum Mixology, is designed to be for our adult audience. Obviously, it was originally designed to be during a happy hour, and we hope it was. it is a fun and learning experience. Um, about history, natural science, and wildlife with a little bit of true crime thrown in every once in a while. And um, if you're so inclined that we would like to see us continue the series, a virtual tip jar is set up and you can find that on our website or I will go ahead and put that in the chat room later on and you can find that link there. Um, some weeks we will be discussing topics that are difficult or sensitive for um, our adult Oz aunts and um, or it may be sensitive for the current due to current events. And we encourage you to carefully read the lecture description and keep in mind um, that it might be sensitive and determine for yourselves if your children should watch it. As a museum, it is our duty to interpret and contextualize political, social, and cultural history, as well as advancements in science and technology. And through this series, we strive to have an honest, open-minded learning experience. Tonight's topic, uh, Mindset of a Champion is brought to us by Kadivas Robinson. Robinson has a distinguished professional career as one of the world's premier 800 meter runners in which he represented the United States at the Olympic Games in Athens in 2004 and London in 2012. He also earned his spot on Team USA at the IAAF World Championships a total of seven times while setting a lifetime personal best of 143.68 in his specialty event. Now I go back, way back uh, with Kadivas, back um, to when we were in college together um, at TCU. He is a Fort Worth native and uh, Fort Worth, Texas and he graduated in 1998 as did I. But while I was just graduating, he was also winning NCAA titles. So he was doing a little bit more than I was while we were there. <laughs> um, working a little bit harder than I was, I think. Um, and he went on to get his master's degree in public administration while doing all that Olympic work as well. Um, and he continued after his professional career as a middle distance runner um, to motivate and inspire others through his speaking and mentoring abilities. He is message speaks to the inner Olympian, which is what he's gonna talk to us about tonight. And he feels that everyone has an Olympic sized goal that awaits to be ignited. He co-founded the Youth Track and Running Club in Santa Monica, California. Oops in Santa Monica, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, he was also awarded the Doherty Fellowship to do research. He served as the president of the TFAA, which is the Track and Field Athletes Association. And I am, he's like, I don't know, maybe I said this, you're currently uh, the coach for Ohio State in track and cross country. Um, he's very generous to take time out of his busy schedule to join us tonight and do this lecture. Um, I'm so excited to see you after all this time. Um, actually hasn't been 25 years. I think I did an exhibit with you maybe 15 years ago. So, um, but I'm super excited to see you and I'm so glad you're doing well and your team's doing well. So let's hear what Kivas has to say. <laughs> you know, um, thanks for the introduction. That was Absolutely. awesome. Um, <laughs> It's amazing because you know time flies, and and and, I, and I'm reminded of when we were back at TCU, and you know we really didn't know what we we thought we knew we wanted to do with our lives. We really didn't know, right? And uh, it just so happened that you know we all go in different directions, but we want to have an influence, you know. And I'm reminded that you know there's two major moments in the person's life: the moment you were born, and the moment you realize why you were born. So most of us, if we're lucky, we're able to realize why we we're born. You know, we, we're able to realize why we are here. And so what happens is when I talk about developing the champion's mindset or, uh, you know, developing that inner Olympian, what I'm talking about is this. We all have an inner Olympian. And what, what is that? That goal might be to be an Olympian like, like myself. That goal might be to, to start your own business or to, uh, 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 to travel around the world, whatever it may be, to be a social worker. My bachelor's degree is in social work, um, to invent something. Whatever that inner Olympian is, 
you know, I think we all have that in us. And what happens in life many times is that life gets tough. You know, we get married or we have kids or we fail. And, and after we fail or we, or we get hit this obstacle, we stop going forward. We stop chasing that inner limping. So what happens is most people ask me, they say, Katie, that's my nickname. They say, you know, you're from the south side of Fort Worth. You, you know, was raised fairly poor. You, you, know, you made good grades or whatever. So how did you go from being in that environment to traveling all around the world, you know, making Olympic teams, world championship teams, coaching at Ohio State and LSU and UNLV and Team USA and traveling to Africa and Brazil and Japan and all these places. How did you do it? And what I say is I never stopped chasing that inner Olympia. And what I mean by that, when life started throwing me a whole bunch of curveballs, I didn't fold, I didn't run, but I ran forward. I fell forward. So when I say run, I mean, most of us, when we start to hit an obstacle, when we start to encounter pain, when we start to, you know, encounter our fear, uh, we run away from it. We avoid it. So what I, what I try to do now is I try everyone I come in contact with, I try to awaken that inner Olympia. And what does that mean? That means I try to find out what is it about them that makes them spark? What gets them up in the morning? Now, most people, they'll say, well, I have to work. But that's not enough. I mean, like working, we have to work to provide, we have to work to live, we have to work for all these other things. But what are you truly excited about? I remember we was all kids, all of us, we was excited about being something. When our parents or our grandparents say, what are you going to be when you, when you grew up, Lacey? She said, I wanted to be something. Or what are you going to be when you grew up, Tommy? He said, I wanted to be something. So that's something that was in us that had us excited. That we was up about. And I know, I know what most people say, well, it's, it's too far now. I'm too old. for, And I, and I always remind people, you know, because uh, we're at that age now that the excuse is we're too old to accomplish certain things. And obviously, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, whatever age, maybe making the actual Olympic team might not be still in the cards, but you still have other Olympic size goals that you can't pursue. And the example I use, and this is not a political rant, is that, you know, the last four to eight years, the most strenuous, most stressful, the most difficult, most powerful job in the world is being president of the United States. And the individuals who run, who run for that position, whether you're talking about Clinton or, or Trump or, or, or Biden, it's in their 70s. Think about that. A lot of people when they're in their 50s and 60s, they're talking about retiring. When they, they're set, they start their 70s, they're trying to check them out of here. And these individuals are in their 70s and they're saying, I'm going to go for the most difficult the most stressful, the most powerful, the hardest job in the world. And what is that? That's a mindset. That's a champion's mindset. And we all have it in us. Now I get it, you know, it's easier for us to, uh, to silence that voice. It's easier for us to just be content. But is that why we're here? Remember I started out by saying there's two major moments in the person's life, the moment you were born and the moment you realize why you were born. So why are you here? You know, why did you pick the job you're at right now? Why do you live in the city you live in? You know what? Sometimes we must ask ourselves these questions because if we can't answer those questions. You know what will happen? We'll keep hitting hurdles. We'll keep falling backward. We'll keep facing obstacles and we won't know why. I'm reminded of a story in one of my favorite books, uh, which is the Bible. And this is not a, a, a religious uh, point, but in this book, Jonah's in this in, in, in this article, the, 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 the section I'm talking about, and Jonah's running away from something. You know, Jonah knows he has something that he needs to do, and he's running away from it because he's he doesn't want to face that fear. He doesn't want to step into his greatness. He rather chill. He rather do other things than to take the hard path and go and step into his greatness, the path that was set before him. So so Jonah's running. And he's on this ship and he's on this boat and the boat's rocking and it's doing this. And all the other people on the boat are like, man, this thing's about to sink. It's about to sink. And Jonah's sitting up there and he's, he's, he's kind of calm. And everybody's like, why are you so calm when we, when we notice that this boat, this boat's about to sink? And Jonah tells them, he says, uh, you know, I know what's happening. I know why the storm's so bad. I know why the, the water's shaking so much. I know why all this stuff is going on. And they say, what, well, what's the deal, Jonah? He said, because God's doing it. They say, what? He said, because I'm running away from something. I'm supposed to be going this way and I'm going this way. So God's upset. God's mad because I'm not going to do my responsibility. 
Well, it didn't take them a long time to figure this stuff out. They said, you know what? Are you telling me that we all gonna drown? This ship's gonna, this boat's gonna sink because you're on because you're running away from your destiny. And he said, yeah. So you know what they did? They said, you know what? Get out of here. They threw him over. Now we've all experienced something similar. We might not have noticed it, but it's, it appears that we're going on this path and we're trying to be comfortable and nothing's working out. And that little voice keeps going in our head saying, you know, you need to uh, try to open your own business. You know, you need to uh, travel to this place. You know, you need to make that phone call. You know, you need to start working out. You know, you need to do whatever. And we just keep avoiding that voice, trying other things. And it's never, no matter how good we are in it, it never's working out for us. No matter how hard we try, we've all been in those situations where we've tried to get in certain relationships. And for some reason, you're a good person. They're good. It just won't work. You're doing everything right. They're doing everything right. And it's just not working. And in the back of your mind, you're knowing, okay, I'm avoiding something. I'm running away from something. And until you start to recognize that and go toward, you know, your destination, go toward, you know, what's set before you, you're gonna, it's going to always be rocky. So what happened is when Jonah got thrown over, you know, a whale swallowed and this is a metaphor, but you, you inside a, the belly of a whale, you can't go nowhere. So it's like, okay, you either gonna be stuck where you're at, stuck in trap where you at, no growth, no improvement, no moving forward, or you're gonna make a decision to have a champion's mindset and go after what's really in your heart and what's really in your brain. So Jonah sat there for a while, I debated, then he made that decision. You know what? I'm supposed to be going that way. It's going to be hard. I don't know if I'm going to succeed. I don't know if I'm going to get it, but I'm going to go toward where I'm supposed to go. And when he made a decision, the wheel spit him out. You know? And that's how it is with us in life. Until we face those fears and those doubts. And I'll tell you this, as an Olympian, you know, as someone who's been fortunate enough to travel all the world. And many times, both times I made the Olympic Games, I would look at the, I would sit back. And if you know me, you know I'm kind of observing like that. I would sit back and I would watch all these, Olymp these Olympians like myself. And I would be asking myself, what makes them any more different than everybody else? W what makes all these individuals so special? What makes them more different than anybody else? I would ask myself these questions over and over and over and over again. And the answer started to come. It's the mindset. You see, all those Olympians and all those people who started, you know, great businesses. You know, Jack Ma talks about how many failures he had and how many times he was, uh, you know, fired or, or, or didn't get the job. All those individuals have fears and doubts also. And it pops in your head. It's like, if you go outside to plant a garden, the weeds just grow. Nobody plants weeds, they just grow. And that's the same th thing that goes on you know, in our minds. No matter who you are, see, we think that champions and winners don't have those obstacles. We think that champions and winners don't have uh, those doubts and fears, they do. But it's just like the movie, uh, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. In a beautiful mind, Russell Crowe is this amazing scientist and he's a professor. He's doing great, but he starts to have some mental issues. And as he has these mental issues, he goes on a whole nother route, the opposite direction in which he was going. And he stays in this, this path for a very long time. And one day, what helped him is that he realized something. He said, I've been going on this path and these people have been chasing me and all these crazy things have been happening for all this time, but these individuals, that keeps chasing me and bothering me, they're not getting older. They're not getting bigger, they're not changing. And life is changed. So we said, you know what? Maybe I am making it. Maybe something is popping in my head. Maybe this isn't real because that little girl and that boy is not getting older, not getting taller, not changing. So now the fears and the things that he was seeing, he recognized when he got back to being a great professor, started back going to work, started doing all the things that he had done before. And one day, one of the other professors came and said, hey, you know what, I noticed you was this great professor and you went through some mental issues. But now you seem like you're doing really, really well and you're back, you're doing things. But I want to ask you a question. He said, um, are you, do you still like hear and see uh, things? And Russell Crowe was like, yeah. And the guy said, oh, oh, for real? Like, do you, 
you still see them and hear them and stuff. And so what do you, how do you, how do you, how do you work with it? What, what do you do now? What's different? I mean, how you get past it? And Russell Crowe looked over and that little girl and that, and that boy was still over there. They were just sitting there. They were still over there. And he said, yeah, they still there. I just ignore them now. You see, that's what we have to do with our fears and doubts. You see, we think that once you accomplish some, once you get to a certain level, once you become a millionaire, once you become a billionaire, once you marry this person, once you lose this weight, once you put muscle on, once you have the right clothes or get the right job or whatever, if the fears and doubts go away, it doesn't work like that. They're still there. But what we can do, what champions do, what winners do is that they learn to block that out. They learn to say, you know what? That fear is going to be there, but I must face that fear. There's a quote that says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you see. And see, I like, I like having these discussions with individuals who are massively successful in the middle of their life because sometimes those individuals feel the most lost. They have a good job. They have a good relationship. They live in a good neighborhood and the whole nine, but inside they feel empty. And why? Because they know that the universe and God has given them more. And the difference between an individual that has a champion's mindset and the winner's mindset and everybody else is that others will get content. You see, I like using Tom Brady because Tom Brady didn't won Lord knows how many Super Bowls and been MVP Lord knows how many times. And he's still going for it. Last year, everybody called him crazy. Why would he lead the New England Patriots, go to some other team? And he done done everything. He's a millionaire. Don't need no more money. He's married to a supermodel. You know, he done won all these Super Bowls and did MVP the whole nine. But see, Tom Brady knew something that others maybe didn't know. But more so, Tom Brady has that champions and that winner's mindset. So inside of him, he said, there's another Super Bowl in there with me. See, most people would have never got to that level because they would have been like, I'm good. Humans. Humans are the only species that knowingly, that knowingly don't try to reach their full potential. What do I mean by that? I mean, you know, I work at a university and it blows my mind because I see, I see st students that can get an A plus or, or A and they'll be at a B plus and they go like, I'm good. You know, I see individuals that can do better in their profession. I see individuals that can do better in their relationship. I see individuals that can do better in their lives, but because they're comfortable, they say, I'm good. And I'm not judging that. I'm just saying, think about it. If a bear can get this big, a bear gets this big. If a cheetah can run this fast, a cheetah runs that fast. But we, we will know we can do better. And not only, not only we know we can do better, we'll know how to do better. And because we're comfortable, we'll, we'll sit there. And later, as time passed, two years, three years, five years passed, we're going like, how did I get here? Where did it all go? And unfortunately, a lot of times is when some dramatic happens. You know, you know, you lose a loved one, you know, you lose a job, some illness or something. Something happens and it wakes you up. And you go, oh my goodness, all these things I wanted to do, I haven't done them yet. And then you start questioning things. And that's why you always have to go back to what I said at the beginning. You have to have your why. The winners and the champions mindset is always looking for a way to move forward. What do I mean by that? You know, if you're not in a good environment, it's hard to grow. You know, so as I said in, in, in the 2004 Olympics in Athens, Greece, as I said in the 2012 Olympics in, uh, in London, England, I sit there and I watch these individuals. Some of them, had, it was their first Olympics and some have won Lord knows how many Olympic goals. And I ask myself, what's the difference? It's the mindset. And the beauty about a mindset is it can be developed. You can develop your mindset because it's a skill set also. And skill sets can be developed by repetition. You know, I, I learned that, you know, the way we talk to ourselves, the people we hang around, all those makes, make a difference. And the way that you do anything, and this is the, the, the point I try to give to everyone, is that the way that your mom or your dad or your spouse or whomever says, I love you to you, no one else can say it like that. Even if they try, there are certain things in life that you got to give to the world. No one else can give to the world. There's certain things that if you don't give to the world, the world won't get it. 
But see, if you don't have that champions and winners mindset, then you're gonna you're gonna quit. Most people, I'm gonna tell you this. People ask me, how did I start running the 800? The 800 is the hardest event in track and field. I know there might be some people watching this uh, track and field runners. They say, no, it's the 400 or 400 hurdles. It's the 800. And people ask me, you know, how did you start running the 800? This is what happened. I picked the hardest event because I knew most people didn't want to hurt. They'll quit. And I said, you know what? Most people, when things get tough, most people quit. So I said, you know what? I'm a genius. Because if I just don't quit, I'll beat most people. So I was already ahead of the curve. And the crazy thing is, it's the same with life. If you just don't quit in most things in life, you'll beat most people. So that mindset tells you that, you know, um, keep pushing forward. That mindset tells you that you can accomplish that goal. And think about this. Let's say, let's say right now you have a great job, a great relationship, but you always want to be a chef. You always want to open your own bakery in the smaller town that you're in. And something is telling you, I don't know if it'll work out and you might not make enough money or whatever it may be. But you take that jump. You take the jump and you say, you know what? I'm going to open this bakery. I'm going to make it happen. So you get prepared. You start opening the bakery. You get all these amazing dishes and you and you start selling them and you, 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 you make them a little bit better in the whole nine. And let's just say for the sake of this conversation that after five years, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. You're still a better baker. You're still a better person. Les Brown said the best. He said a goal isn't just there to entice you to accomplish the goal. He said you get more by pursuing the goal and sometimes then accomplishing the goal because there's power in pursuit. Because the person you're going to become in pursuing that goal is going to be a better version of yourself than you were when you first started. You see, right now, I can have a goal of bench pressing 500 pounds. And I can start, and I can do everything right. Now, remember, that's life, right? Do everything right, and it just don't work out. It's called life. And that's the beauty of it. Do everything right in your relationship, just don't work out. Do everything right in your job, just don't work out. Do everything. That's, it sucks, but that's life. That doesn't mean we run for it. So I can have a goal of bench pressing 500 pounds. I can take as much protein as I want, get all the rest I need to get. I can drink all the water I need to drink. I can work out every day, three, four, five years. And I can be at 200 pounds when I start bench pressing, and I get up to 465 pounds, and I never get to 500 my goal. But you know what? I'm so much stronger because I was at 200 and now I'm at 465. And whatever it took for me to go from 200 to 465, those things are applicable in other areas of life. That's the point. The point is, do we ever stop and just think about what we can accomplish if we just start and don't quit? And all that is, is a champion's mindset. All that is, is a winner's mindset. And anyone, anyone can have it. And if they don't, you can develop it. You know, I always say this, success leads clues. But failure does too. <laughs> success leads clues, failure leads clues. So what do I mean? Let's say you have a goal, whatever it may be. Now, I always tell people this. I tell my athletes this all the time. I say, now, who's the greatest boxer of all time? People say Muhammad Ali. Greatest basketball player, greatest investor, they say Warren Buffett, okay. No matter the profession, no matter if it's a scientist, no matter if it's a speaker, no matter if it's an athlete, no matter if it's a lawyer, no matter what it is, about 95 to 100% of them in those individuals have either A, a coach or a mentor. That's what I call a clue. So as you look for your goals, I see people trying to do it on their own. And I'm like, just why? You have a goal of doing whatever it is and you're trying to do it on your own? Get you a coach. Get you a mentor. That way you can avoid some of the mistakes that they make. That's the champion's mindset. A champion's and winner's mindset is understanding that, you know, I don't have to do this all by myself. You see, when you have a, when you have a mentor, when you have a coach and you mess up, they don't leave you in the mess. They turn your mess into your message. And they let you understand that that test you just went to, through can be your testimony. So what 
what is your goal? You know, for, for everyone, what is your real goal? Not, not what's your goal that someone else wants for me for you. Not what's your goal uh, that, that you just think you can accomplish. What is it that's inside of you that you really want to accomplish? Matter of fact, what is it that's inside that you really want to say? There's something you probably want to tell someone. And if the pandemic didn't teach us anything, it taught us that sometimes certain things need to be said. Now, there's a caveat to that. Sometimes things don't need to be said, but you get my point. What is it that you have that's in you that you've been putting back because of fear? What is it that you've had in you that you know you need to bring out? And by not bringing it out, that means you have what I would call a non-champion's mindset. Because the champion's mindset says, okay, that goes in front of me. And instead of me making the same mistakes that Jonah made, why do you have to get on this boat or this ship and let it almost sink? And have all your friends and family and anybody you go around, because anybody you go around, it starts to make things shake. Have them have to throw you over and you be trapped in this certain situation, in a certain environment before you finally say, okay, I'm going to get it. See, that's the scary part. The scary part is saying I'm going to get it, not knowing if it's actually going to come to fruition. I use myself as an example. See, I made two Olympic teams, but I missed two Olympic teams also. And both times I missed the Olympic team, I got fourth, the dreaded fourth. They take three, and fourth is the first person out. And both times I got fourth, it was by a small margin. Now, here's the catch. The first time I missed it was in uh, when I was pretty young, right out of college. So I had to wait four more years just for the opportunity to try to make the team. It was no guarantees. Then the second time I missed it, I was a little bit older, married and had kids. So now it's a little bit more on the line. Now that if I waited four more years to do it, I'm gonna be four more years older. My kid would be four more years older and it, just, and it, and it wouldn't just affect me, it affected others just for the opportunity to try not to, get, it wasn't guaranteed that it was gonna happen. You know what that's called? It's called life. But I knew that if I didn't go for it, at least go for it, it didn't mean I was gonna make it, if I didn't at least go for it, I would be 50, 60, 70, 80 years old saying, man, if only I would've, you know? And I tell people, and, this, and it sounds kind of harsh, and you see people all the time, you see them say, guys, Man, I could have been in the, I could have played college ball. Man, I could have been the, I could have started my own bit. I could have been an investor. I could have been, well, no, you couldn't. No, you, I'm sorry, but you couldn't because you didn't, you didn't even try it. And, and that's hard, but it's the, it's the reality. See, that's a way to me, that's sometimes a way of saying you being something without actually being it. See, the hard part is really trying it and then failing and then trying it again and then failing and then trying it again and failing and then accomplishing it. That's the champion's mindset. That's the winner's mindset. And that goes to everything. I joke with some, I give, I mentor, I consult. And it's amazing because some of the people that I mentor and consult with are, are massively successful. Uh, a lot of the men are older and they're massively successful. But when it comes to other areas of their life, they are, they are a little bit less confident. And I always give them the example. I say, I say, now listen, remember when you was younger, the guy, who used to get all the girls, the guy was a turd. And we all know it, we're like, why do the girls like this clown? Like, like, look at him. And you know how he's gonna act. And he gets all the girls and we don't understand. And here I am, a nice guy. And he's like, it's, it's tough for me. That old saying said, you know, closed mouths don't get fed, but squeaky tires get all. But the example I give them is this, when that guy tries, when he tries to talk to the girls and the girls, uh, they, they turn them down. What does he do? He keeps trying. See, some of us, when we fail, it hurts our ego, it hurts our pride, and we don't want to feel it again, so we don't go back to try it again. But most of the individuals that are massively successful and they hear a no, they come back again and again and again because a delay is not a denial. Now, obviously, when it comes to certain things, you have to put the work in. You can't just you know, get up under the bar and try to bench 500 pounds if you ain't really practiced for it, you know? You have to develop yourself into the person that if you're trying to, you know, 
uh, work a certain job or trying to start a certain business, you have the skill set and the mindset to accomplish those things. But the main things, what I found is most people uh, that's not accomplishing their goals, it's not because they're not good enough. It's not because they're not smart enough. It's simply because they're simply not trying or they've given up. They're settling. And it's sad because it's like, I know people that's 50, 55 and saying, well, and I'm thinking to myself, my friend, if you live to be 80, you got 25 more years. If you live to be 90, it's just mad. So it ain't even that you're not accomplishing certain things because you don't have the ability, because you don't, you don't have the time, because you do. It's the mindset. And sometimes we need individuals to help us see things differently. I learned that, you know, sometimes you see some things one thing, one way, and you need somebody else to come see another one. I remember when I was, uh, I was putting off on a lot of things because I wanted to make the Olympic team. And I was putting off on all these other things in my life. And so one day, one of me and my, my mentor and I was sitting down and we was having a meal. And uh, he asked me, said, Kadivas, why aren't you doing A, B, and C? And I said, well, you know, remember I, I missed the Olympic team the first time when I was right out of college. So I said, you know, I really want to make an Olympic team and I really want to do this, this and that. And I, and this, I don't know if it's going to be a distraction or hold me back and this, this and that and all those things. And he looked at me and he said, well, Kadivas, how do you know that having those things or doing those things or in those things won't make things better? I'm like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I never thought that if I got in a more committed relationship, things would get better. I never thought if I volunteered for different nonprofits that things could actually get better. I never thought that if I was more giving of myself or giving more of my resources or, or whatever it may be. That, see, I was only thinking the way I think. I needed someone to think differently. Sometimes we must surround ourselves with thinking that outthinks us. I want to re repeat that. Sometimes you need to be around thinking that outthinks you. Because that's, that's what I help you. So when I speak about the champion's mindset, when I think, speak about the winner's mindset, I mean, which is Kadivism, is what is your higher self? Are you navigating at your highest level right now? I gave my student, uh, some of my student athletes a, a, a question. And I do this with some of the, uh, the individuals and executives I consult with. And, you know, and I, and I asked them, I say, uh, I want you to think about and write down who's the hardest working person you know that you've ever worked with ever and who's the hardest working person you work with now. And, and they'll write it down and then the next week we'll come back and they'll give, it, give me the answer. And I ask them, I say, and let me ask you a question. If I was to ask all your friends or all your coworkers the same question, would any of them say you? And when they stop, they think, I say, and if they wouldn't say you, so you're saying somebody else, so that proves that that's more in you. You're saying the hardest working person that you're working with or doing this or whatever it may be, the most accomplished, the most brave, you can, you can frame that anyway. Who's the bravest person you know right now you've worked with? Who's the, who's the person that's faced their fears? Who's the person, whatever it may be. And if, and if, and if those individuals, the group you're around, if the friends you're around, if the, your coworkers, if the environment you're with, if you're not, if none of them say you, think about that. Can, do you have more? Can you put, see, that's the winner's mindset. The winner's mindset is looking at that and saying, you know what? I work hard. But man, none of them will say, I'm the, I got to step my game up. Not just because you're going to get a promotion. Not just because you're going to get more money, not because you want everybody to see, because there's more in you. Because there is more in you. And what you're going to do is take it, which I always say the person, you know, the, 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 the singer. You know, yeah, I, I know individuals that I, you'll be watching TV or some or on the internet, they'd be like, man, look at such a, I can sing better than them. Well, you know, where are you singing at? In the shower? We all sing in the shower, you know? 
Have you ever really put yourself out there? Have you put a video on YouTube? Have you went to your church and, and seen? Have you asked uh, an event or organizer? Can you sing the Star Spangled Banner or, or the National Anthem or something? Have you really went out there and did it? Well, I did it once and other. Well, you know what? Once. I wish it was that easy. Is there, there's more in you. And if there's not more, and if you're giving everything you got all the time and you found it, then you need to share that with somebody else. Meaning, because there's a lot of people that are paid top money and it's not about the money to figure out how you got to a point where you've gotten yourself able to do that. And I'm going to tell you what that is. That's the champion's mindset. That's the winner's mindset. That's the, that's the ability to fail forward in everything we do. The series like this for the Tallahassee Museum is extremely important. That's the beauty of museums. It shows us some of the, 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 the mistakes that was made in the past, but some of the things that, you know, that, 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 that we overcame. You know, it says, uh, Einstein said, the thinking that's gotten me to this point has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. You must think different thoughts sometimes. And museums help us understand how things were before and how and where they can be and how they got to where they're at now. And the champion's mindset says that, you know what? I'm doing well. I'm happy, you know, in the environment I'm living in. You know, I'm, I love my job and the whole nine. But is there more in me? Because if there's more in me, if there's a book in me, if there's a song in me, if there's a dance in me, if there's a recipe, whatever it may be, I have to give it to the world because nobody else can give it to it. I'm going to leave you with this. Think about this. You know, I remember when I was a kid, my, my mom and my grandparents could put, they could fix anything. They just, it, it, it looked like they could, they could use leftovers and fix something. It tastes good. <clears throat> so when I went off to college, <clears throat> I tried to fix the same thing. I try to fix the cake or the lasagna, whatever it may be. And um, I would call my parents and I'd call my grandma and say, hey, you know, how do, how do I make such and such? And she'd give me the exact ingredients and I'll put the exact thing in it and it wouldn't taste the same. No matter if I put the exact ingredients, it wouldn't taste the same because it's just the way that she stirred it up or it's just the way that she put the salt in or whatever it may be. How in the world can you make a cake? And you know, when your parents are finished making the point of cake, you still got the bowl with the little cake stuff on you. And you're like, how can that taste any different? And you, you would think, but see, that's, that's how it is in the world. What you got to bring to the world, what you can bring to the world, no one else can give to the world. And the champion's mindset says, okay, you know what? I know I have something to give to the world. And I've been, maybe you've been giving it to the world, but have you been giving it to the world the way you need to give to the world? At, at the level you need to give to the world. See, most people, I remember uh, about two weeks ago, someone gave me an idea on a book. They said, you know, I read this book. It was a great book and uh, you should read it. And what do I do? I go get the book the next day. Most people won't do that. Most people, when they get some advice, they won't use it. And that's why most people are not massively successful. So if, if I can leave you with anything, it's this. Two major moments in a person's life, the moment you were born, the moment you realize why you were born. And once you realize why you was born, spend your days living that why. And if you do that, you have the champion's mindset. I don't know if I have any questions, but if I do, I'll be more than pleased to answer them. I think you're on mute, Lacey. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, please go ahead and post your questions um, in the chat room or the Q&A. Um, I have a question for you, actually. You early on talked about the process of um, developing your skill set to build that mindset. Um, do you have like a step-by-step -step methodology for that or is that kind of a personal um intuitive thing or how do you go through well, that uh, well here's, here, here's here's what i do i i find out what it is that i want or need or want to try to accomplish right. then i find someone who's doing it hmm. and then i reach out to them you have i mean that's the hardest part for us but reach out reach out to them and then once i have a blueprint it be, you know, it becomes a little bit, I don't want to say easier, but it becomes a little bit better. Okay. So to me, that's the first step. And then you tell people, because once you, if, you know, like if, 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 if I was to tell you right now, I'm writing uh, this book that I'm so excited about. Mm -hmm. 
And if we didn't talk for two months, when you see me, you'll say, well, how's the book? Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, oh, I ain't really started it whatever. And if you don't see me for another three months, you'll be like, hey, how's that book going? You told me, you see, when you put it out there and mm-hmm. people start to ask you about it and that they, they, they holds your feet to the fire. So I get a mentor and a coach. I've learned that because here's the deal. Muhammad Ali had, has had a coach or a mentor. Tom Brady, any great, Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, you name it, presidents, they all have had mentors or coaches. So for me, that's the first step. Is is a the second step. The a the first step is recognizing what you really want, mm-hmm. you know. And it can be something as small as uh, you know, like you said, writing a book or cooking a recipe or you know, running a marathon, whatever. And then you say, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm not there yet. Who's done this? Who can probably help me out? And then ask. And you know, maybe they say no, but that's fine. But at least ask you know and then if they say no you find somebody else and ask them and then now what happens is as humans see humans we are more alive we have an aim we have something we're trying to accomplish what gets tough for adults is that up until we graduate let's say college or get married it's kind of set for us you know, you know, you got to go to school, you got to graduate from high school, you got to graduate from college, then you got to get married, you got to have kids, you got to buy a house. And then now it's like, you got all those things. It's like, what do I do now? See, now you got to come up with some stuff by yourself. And a lot of people, you would say, have everything in the world, but they might be a little empty. Mm-hmm. Why? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of, and, and this might not be the best example, but I'm reminded of Anthony Bourdain. And it's like, this guy, you know, you look from the outside and you go, I mean, he has a job that I think we all want to travel the world, eating great foods, and, mm-hmm. and you're rich doing it on TV. Right. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, we can be doing the most amazing thing. We can be as rich as possible. We, travel. we can be doing all these things. But if we're not doing what, what the universe of God put us here to do, we're mm-hmm. still going to feel a little bit, a little bit empty. So we got to have that aim. It helps us wake up. It helps us go through the hard times. And you're going to go through hard times because that's life. Right. And, uh, and, and once you do that, you're more alive. You're more alive, even if you don't accomplish that goal, but at least you're, you got to aim at something that you're, you're, you're working toward. Okay. We have a question down here. Uh, Benita, Mr. Robinson, you are an amazing and wise man. I appreciate you saying, taking the time to speak to us. You have a wonderful gift. I agree, Thank Benita. You. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, We've got uh, Linda says, what a positive message. Thank you. Lisa says, thank you so much for inspiring and entertaining us. No actual questions, you guys? No questions. No no questions. Well, I have to tell you, I agree with you about 800. I was put on the 800 in junior high and nobody else wanted to do it. So I got put on it and I was like, nope. mm -mm." I ran it one season, I think, seventh grade, and that was it. Yeah, yeah, that the 800 is a is a is a tough event. That's a true story. That's one. Of, that's one of the main reasons I decided to uh, to do it because nobody else really wanted to do it. So it is. It's a hard event, and I, I never ran it again after that. So, so uh, the the um, what's the big initiative right now for the for the Tallahassee Museum? Oh uh, well, right now we're getting ready for. Um, uh, May well April is Autism Awareness Month nationally so we're uh, bringing that in and we are becoming an autism friendly business um, as part of the uh, our initiative so um, being able to have our staff trained in working with spectrum disorders as well mm-hmm. as um, hiring um, people who are on the spectrum and then um, we're in May um, we essentially, Florida so it kind of celebrates um, emancipation in May, um, since we emancipated in May, um, May 20th. So we're doing a lot of events preparing for that. Um, I've got, I'm setting up speakers in May for doing, um, for essentially Black History. It's our Black History Month, so um, we're doing a lot of that, which is exciting. Um, working with a lot of um, authors and, and speakers on that, so that's fun. Um, you know, I've worked with... Um... I don't, I don't really tell this story a lot, but when I first moved to Santa Monica, California, mm-hmm. um, I worked with some kids that was autistic. Oh. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Because my bachelor's, you know, social work. Yeah, so my bachelor's in social work. And so, and they are absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. Because, and, and you know this, but um, there is 
varying degrees of autism, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of individuals, I worked with a, a, a young man, he's, he's an adult now, but uh, just a genius, you know, mm -hmm. when it came to um, school and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, and that again, that again highlights the mind, how powerful the mind is and having a different mind, having certain mindsets because some of them, you know, I worked, ironically enough, I worked with um, a young lady that um, when, I was, when I was coaching high school and I promise you, like, uh, you, could, you, you couldn't tell she was autistic at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Like she was about as normal as normal can get, was a great student, great kid, Mm -hmm. social skills were great the whole nine uh but you know she she was particular on, when you tell her to do um you know a run she's going if you say um run two miles she's gonna run exactly two miles you know right. so i i found um the, the individuals absolutely fascinating because mm -hmm. again they made me see things by their questioning Mm -hmm. And by the way, they saw things, made me see things differently. And a, and a exactly. mind expanded never goes back to original form. Exactly. It's, I mean, it just creates so much. I mean, it expands you so much and then teaches you so much when working with on um, people of all abilities. So it's it's amazing experience. Um, but Ina wants to know, when you're working with youth, what has been the most difficult issue you've had to help someone overcome? Oh, man. With youth, that, <laughs> you, yeah, because you gotta, you know, nowadays, I think the biggest challenge a lot of us are having is that, you know, nowadays the kids have what we didn't have and that's this internet. So they do have access to all sorts of, of, of things. And so that true, that true interaction is, is um, I don't know if it's there mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the peer pressure is a little different because, you know, you know, when you don't, when you when you look at Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn or, or, or in a Facebook or whatever, those likes become important to some, mm -hmm. a lot of individuals. So the challenge I have now is, is getting under, individuals to understand that in reality, a lot of that is not real. It's hard to say that when it feels real because mm -hmm. I have to remember that, that the internet has been here their, their entire lives. But I, what I try to remind, even adults, what I try to remind is, is no one puts the, the bad stuff online. No. You know, they put their successes, no. they put when they got the nice clothes or whatever it may be, but they don't put the, the opposite on there. And so working with youth now is, is hard. Um, let, you know, giving them these compliments that are absolutely true when they're not getting it in the in the avenue that they want it so i always tell parents i always tell um you know uh teachers or mentors that we have to meet these kids where they are it's it's hard because we have to remember that you can't see yourself when you're in the frame and, and what i'm what i mean by that those a lot of those kids these youth they can't they can't see themselves and so they're viewing themselves from the spectrum of what they're what, what they're getting online and you know, there's a movie, there's a, uh, a documentary called Social Dilemma, and it talks about how when, when, when any of us click on something online, it's an algorithm that lets the computer or whatever know what we like and what we click, and it keeps giving us more of that. So sooner or later, what's going to happen is we're going to get a whole bunch of stuff similar to what we've been clicking on or what we somewhat interested on. Unfortunately, if you happen to be in, in, in a bad mood or a negative environment, or a negative whatever, you're gonna to continue to get a lot of that. And the subconscious, you remember a lot of kids, you know, our subconscious and our brains and mind is not fully developed. So if we're getting a lot of that at a young age, mm -hmm. no matter how amazing they may be, that's why coaches and teachers and social work are so, 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 so important. And I always, I'm very passionate about this. When I was a kid, coaches was an extension of the family. Think about that, when you, if you played any sport, a teacher and a coach, they were extensions of the family. If you, if your parents wasn't able to pick you up on time from school, you could be at the school with the teacher and your parent knew you were safe. They knew you were all right. If something happened to anybody in your family, 
the whole, your teachers, the whole school, maybe the whole community would know and, 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 and rally behind you. If you, if you played a sport, uh, the coach sometimes be the person that fed. I mean, they was, and, 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 and some of that is lost now. And it's, and it's unfortunate because we forget as mentors and as coaches and as parents, we forget that some of those things are still needed. What do I mean by that? As a parent, I have to be reminded that luckily my kids don't have to go through the same things I had to go through. I had to, you know, I had to struggle a bit and, and I had to walk to school and I, and I had to, you know, in the rain, I had to figure out when it started raining, I'd just be at school wet and, and just all these little things, you know, that we, that, that we didn't have, we had to go through and we forget that, okay, oh, I had to, you know, and I'm not saying this is the best, but I had to fight, you know, I had to learn how when the kids would pick on me because my clothes maybe wasn't the best or I'm darkening the area or whatever it may be, I had to learn to have tough skin and be able to, to deal with that, right? And what we forget is that when we want our kids and we want people to have it so much better than us, which I do, there's a part of that that strengthens them. It's like these calluses, right? Sometimes we have to, not only calluses on your hand when, you, when, you, when you're lifting something tough, we have to callous the brain to make ourselves stronger. And if we are always protecting our kids so much, they don't get those calluses to be able to withhand, uh, withstand life, you know? I find that now a lot of kids, they're encountering, the first time they encounter something that they have to, to fix on their own, it's when they're already in college. Mm -hmm. And so when they, when they see an obstacle, when they see something that's, a, that, that's, that's tough for them, they fold. They, 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 they go way deep down into to struggling because they've never went through anything. Now, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that for some of us, what helped us because we had our big brother and big sister, you know, beating us up, or because we had to go through through certain things, because we had to learn to deal with certain things. So the toughest thing I have now is a lot of these kids because you know they've been maybe sheltered or because they get all their interactions from online or the internet. It's the uh, they haven't went through the healthy uh, rejections. You remember when we was kids on Valentine's Day? You asked somebody to be a Valentine's Day little no, and they would check no. <laughs> Right? You'd be like, oh my goodness. I wrote this letter and everybody know and she just sit there and said no. And now I have to be feeling embarrassed that, mm -hmm. you know, she doesn't say, and sometimes somebody else will get the letter and like, oh, he, he wrote that letter and she said no. And you have to, you know, you feel sad. You feel like it's the end of the world, you know, but you get through it. And nowadays you see that, you know, yeah. it's hard for a lot of, yeah, it's hard for me to deal with that. So to answer your question, that's what I found is, uh, it's one of the toughest things for youth right now is uh, is dealing with those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got one from Linda wants to know when did you realize the why, and how has it changed? Has it has it changed through your life? So when I would when I was running track and field professionally, I found myself every at the end of year, every season when I would fly back from Europe or you know Asia or whatever, asking myself, now why am I running? Now, this is after I had, you know, won a USA championship or made an Olympic team or whatever. And, you know, it was I, I realized it wasn't about the money and it wasn't about the fame or whatever that may be. But I couldn't answer the question. I didn't know why. I kept asking myself, why, why, why? So what happened, it's an ironic story. I always tell this story. In 2008, I was in great shape. I was older at that point, older than some of the guys I was, you know, I almost old enough to be their dad, some of the guys I was running against. And I didn't make the, the team. I missed out and we all dove and I was for it. And it was just, it was rough. But what happened is this, when that happened, I lived in Santa Monica, California at the time. And I went back to my apartment. And usually when you live in Santa Monica, you live in an area, you don't go to Venice Beach in the summer because it's packed. It's touristy, it's packed. And if you live there, you just avoid it. But because I was so down and kind of whatever, I said, I'm gonna go for a walk. So I put on regular clothes. And remember, this is the summer. It's, it's packed. I, and I go for a walk on Venice Beach. And as I'm walking on Venice Beach, it's packed. I don't know nobody. I got regular clothes. An African guy who was selling incense, he saw me and said, oh, my goodness, KD, man, you're my favorite runner, man. Keep You motivate me. You inspire me. Your interviews are the greatest. This is the reason. And he just started telling me all this stuff. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at him. And I don't know this guy. And it's packed. And so everybody stops because you're in L.A., right? And they're thinking I'm somebody famous. They're looking at me. And I'm like, because I don't know this guy. <laughs> and he was a, a guy that 
watched track and he was a runner and he knew me, but I didn't know who he was. And evidently, the way I ran my interviews inspired him. And he told me, you know, don't retire because I watched track because of you and, and the way you, you go for it. And you, even if you lose, you still come back again. And, and that makes me think, you know, I'm a, as I'm doing my business, no matter if I keep going, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And then later I would have grandparents and parents go, hey, you know, I'm so sad that, uh, you know, that you didn't make the team and, and uh, but I like how you, and my grandson and you inspired him and the way, and I didn't, I never knew. You see, it took me failing. And, 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 and appearing to be vulnerable for them to feel comfortable to come up to me and say these things. And then I realized some, I realized that running and track was a vehicle. It was a vehicle for me to inspire and motivate others. It's a vehicle for me, for people to, un, to know that, okay, I got this huge goal and I'm gonna give it all I got and I might just fail. But you know what? In me failing, it still helps someone else go for it. Because what they saw was, they saw that this was a regular guy and he's going for this huge goal. And even if he don't make it, he's putting everything. I mean, he's putting everything in it. And so now they feel like, you know what? I can do that too. Because you know what? It's all right if I feel, as long as I put everything in. Just like I'm motivated by Katie and I'm cheering them on. I, I feel like if I try my goal now, I'll make it somebody be motivated by me. And I had so many people telling me that. And I would have never known if I didn't feel. So I realized my why who has failure. And so from that point on, Whenever I do these types of interviews, whenever I'm mentoring people, whenever I'm going somewhere, I make sure I give it my all. Because that's that's my why. I believe if I don't give this message, see, see every zero knows a hero, every dud knows a stud. And what I mean by that is, sometimes I've given, uh, you know, presentations to a room of three people. But see, you never know. You never know who that person knows. And you never know, if you don't give this message, to this person, you don't know if they'll, they, they may not get it from nobody else. They might be thinking about suicide. They might be thinking about giving up. They might be thinking about quitting. And they might be that person. And, and, there's, and there's a lot of, you know, examples of this in every spiritual book, no matter what you believe in. You know, some of the things that happen in life, we think that they, they have for this reason. We come to find out five, 10 years later, we find out the real reason they have. So I realized my why when I, when I failed in that race, because I would have never known that this many people was even watching me. And it wasn't that I was winning. See, that was the thing. That's what got me was that they were saying, you know, we don't care about the winning and stuff. It's like, you always go for it. They liked it. It was like, they can tell I'm giving everything. And they were saying, and it's, it's since they were saying, how can you give everything after you've just gotten beat and lost in front of everybody. Aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you afraid? But you still do it. And that gave them motivation. So that's how I found my wife. That's awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? It doesn't look like we've got any more posts. Not yet, okay. Well, thank you so much, Kadivas. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to post in there um, in the chat room if you are um, interested in continuing the series. Um, we do have a tip jar. It's totally not necessary, but it is appreciated. Um, so thank you so much for being here, everybody. And we will see you. Oh, Lisa wants to know how you met your wife. <laughs> funny enough i met her i met her at college i met her at tcu and um and so we're total opposites like when i say total opposites she's quiet and shy i'm outgoing so we are like she does she's not an athlete i mean we like um total opposites but you know here it is 20 some years later and, and, and I, I live in columbus ohio we done moved from texas to santa Monica, california to las vegas to the Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Louisiana to, yep. <laughs> man. All over, yeah. She yeah, has, man. She's, she's put up with it with you, huh? <laughs> yeah. She's yeah, you know, that's <laughs> that's the thing about uh, just think about life though. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you're open to opportunities, you I tell you, man, one of the things I will I, I keep saying this through all my travels, I keep saying this. There are so many people. I don't know how to say this, that have so much in them. Mm -hmm. and, and they know it. 
you see it, you see, when you talk to them, you sit in their eyes, you can feel it, energy's real. Mm-hmm. And, they, and, they, and they just won't, they won't put it out there. And, and that's what gets me because I'm around, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be around some high achievers, but there are people, there's seriously, there are people that can achieve even more. And the only reason they're not achieving more is because they just not, they're not, they're afraid to try it. Mm-hmm. it it's hard, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like we all have a friend that's like beautiful. And like, we all, like everybody thinks she's beautiful, but she don't think she's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And you're like, girl, like <laughs> everybody likes you. Like, you're like, are you serious? And it's like, she's navigating, like maybe it's when she smiles, she hides her smile, you know? And you're like, why are you hiding your smile? Mm-hmm. Oh, you get him a point? It's like, <laughs> that's how it is in some aspects of life. Like so many people, and I see it, and it's a, it's a blessing and a curse because it's like, it's a blessing because you can see it, but it's a curse because you just want to tell those people, try it, like go <laughs> cook it or so whatever it might be. It's so much more. So much and the more. world needs it. And yeah. the world needs it. I'm telling Absolutely. you, that's the, that's the thing. The world, we're, we're, we're having a, let me say this real quick. The world right now, and, and I hope I got the words to say this right. The world, not just the US, the world right now is having what I call an energy shift. And what I mean by that is the world is very global now. The connections between Africa, Asia, uh, Australia, whatever, it's so, it's as close as it has ever been. And so people are awake, when I, when I say waking up is, there's people that, there, there are women in places that, that 50 years ago, they couldn't drive cars, whereas now they want to run for office, right? So it's this shift going on in the world, right? And so with that shift, the, 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 the energy and the time is right for, for individuals that, that have this in them to bring it forth. Because there was a time 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, when we didn't know what we know now. You know, we didn't have the means or the, the science wasn't there or the, or the time wasn't right. But right now that time is right. And, and, and who's gonna who's gonna be the ones that's gonna be rewarded are the ones who are gonna take jump on that now. You know, there's a quote that says the learners will inherit the earth while the learn it will find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. And it's like um, an individual that still thinks they can't uh, maybe drive cars and they can. So what I what I what I try to say is this. There's so many people that have something to give to the universe or give to the world. And, 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 and I even remind my parents, moms and dads, that by you doing that, by you, it, it sends a message to the kid. It sends a message to your kid. Because we all have this inside of us that we want to, we know and we want to come from greatness. We want to, we want to be like, well, my mom or my grandmother, she was the best cook and, and she started, whatever that may be. So in you, Fulfilling your full potential, it gives your kids uh, confidence because they get it through you, even if they don't say nothing. They always watch. That's how that's how kids are. They might not say. It. They might be too cool to say it, you know. But 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 they're always watching. That's why I make the point. My son's thirteen. And he's almost as tall as I am, and, I, and you best believe I go in there and I kiss him and love him, <laughs> you know, because I know right now he might, you know, whatever. But I know, you know, when I'm gone. He gonna remember that because I remember from my my stepdad and my grandparents. Mm-hmm. So I say that to everyone is like you know if you don't get anything else from this is that there's something in you that you, God you know whatever and 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 every no, nobody else might not see it and that's fine you know that's fine but you gotta at least try it mm-hmm. and if it doesn't work then cool you know it just doesn't work that's life but you gotta at least at least try it because by you trying it. Maybe your daughter, maybe your son will go, man, dad really tried that. He always talked about, he thought he was the best barbecue in the world. He really tried it. So when he gets 20 years from now, he's going to want to try something. And he's going to go, you know what? I come from, I'm a Robbins. And, the, and even if we don't succeed, we, we go and try it. And, it's, and then he's going to succeed though. Yep. And as you older, you're going to look and see your son succeed on something. Or your daughter succeed on something that she wanted, and she tried it because you tried it, you did succeed, and so really you succeed. See, yeah, that's how this game. <laughs> that's how and it that's the champion's mindset. <laughs> I don't want to take all your time, but I get so I no, get so no, passionate no. about this. No, it's awesome. Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. Everybody's being really quiet now. 
So I will say good night. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we all thoroughly enjoyed it. And like I said, we will have this up on YouTube later tonight for everybody. Um, I have will be hoping to see everybody in a couple weeks on April 8th. We've got Kathy Zinkos from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. She's going to be talking about um, Autism Awareness Month and how the museum has been becoming, been becoming an autism friendly business. So hope to see you um, on April 8th. And thank you so much again, Stevis. I mean, it's so good to see you. It's been forever, but it's awesome to see you again. And I'm so glad you're doing well and enjoying you. your time in Ohio. <laughs> I am. Thanks for having me. All right. And I met Kadivas on, on all social media, so I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and please, please reach out um, and I'll um, answer any questions if you want to reach out to me via email or anything later. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Stay safe.